Dead man walking on a green mile. In 1994, to little fanfare and even fewer box office receipts, The Shawshank Redemption came and went, losing seven Academy Award nominations and a chunk of money in the process. One re-release, some lucrative syndications and a flurry of video rental word of mouth later, and this little film that could grew from a fresh fish in a pop culture prison yard to a titan of audience adoration and a favourite movie for every dad in the world to watch on a Sunday afternoon. I can honestly say that I'm a changed man. Five years later, writer-director Frank Darabont stepped behind the camera once again for another Stephen King story of incarceration, absolution, interracial kinship, eccentric gents with tiny pets, crooked guards, Christian undertones, and a man falsely implicated in a double murder by a loudmouthed lunatic. The Green Mile. I'm seeing double here. Four green miles. I never realised just how much overlap there was until I wrote that joke, but all their common connections aside, this long walk into oblivion for the decent and the damned alike is very much a different character altogether. Watch this. Watch what he do. <laughs> On death row in the Great Depression-era Louisiana, prison guard Paul makes the acquaintance of the soft-spoken, condemned-to-die John Coffey. After witnessing John's supernatural ability to heal all whom he touches, Paul is forced to reckon with good, evil, and the moral order of all he knows. The middle instalment of Frank Darabont's Stephen King trilogy, which he'd cap off exceptionally with The Mist eight years later, The Green Mile melds magical realism, horrific barbarity, and outstretched acts of kindness, all wrenched forth from the depths of spiritual and physical despair. Oh, oh god. Oh god. Each entry in his loosely affiliated trilogy expertly articulates the lived-in details of each environment, the collision of winsome Americana with searing violence, and the colloquial chatter and plain-spoken drawls of ordinary folks engulfed by the extraordinary. Darabont's uncanny knack for mimicking King's authorial voice to the point where drastic expansions, new additions, and word-for-word -word inclusions become indistinguishable from one another, now that's the mark of a good adaptation. But it's his confidence when ironing out the flaws in the original prose and tightening the cinematic strings where required that makes them great translations. The Green Mile is largely an exhaustively faithful retelling of its paperback counterpart, and what additions and omissions are made are done to sure up the thematic ballast and streamline the core messaging of the text. It must be something that you want. I ain't never seen me a flicker show. So, now we get a full circle moment where Wetmore ends up in the same asylum room that Wild Bill started, in comes a prologue where an elderly Paul crumbles at the sight of Fred Astaire, which in turn plants the bittersweet seeds that only blooms when John watches Top Hat on the eve of his execution, and out goes the unnecessary death of Mr. Jingles, and a superfluous third villain, who in the book is a bullish orderly at the old folks' home, who's pretty much Ben Stiller from Happy Gilmore, but played completely straight. Now you will go to sleep, or I will put you to sleep. Check out the name tag. You're in my world now, Grandma. The most pronounced and profound change from the novel is that, aside from John's unambiguous innocence, the sins of the other two men killed in the electric chair are never spoken. All we need to know about the death penalty is that it disproportionately affects poor, non-white and developmentally disabled defendants, and that any claims of its painless efficiency are one dry sponge away from the most drawn-out, despicable cruelty you could ever conceive. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, in the book, we are told that Bitterbuck stabbed a man to death over a pair of boots, and the lovable Dell is a raping, murdering arsonist, which completely undercuts the empathy and consideration an average audience might be willing to extend their way. What the film understands better than that original text is that, for a work so steeped in Catholicism, guilt, contrition, salvation, and the fallibility of our earthly frames, we don't need to know the hows or whys of what brought these men to the mile. He's paid what he owed. He's square with the house again. So keep your goddamn hands off him. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told of the two men crucified alongside Christ. If John is our stand-in here for Jesus, then that makes Bitterbuck and Dell the good thieves who are forgiven and granted entry into the Kingdom of Heaven. I'm sorry for what I do. I give anything to take it back. <laughs> but I can't. God have mercy on me. Wild Bill and Wetmore, on the other hand, represents the unrepentant thieves. Offering no apologies or recompense for their sadistic atrocities, they in turn receive no assurances or redemption when they meet their ultimate end. The Green Mile, like the Shawshank Redemption before and the Mist after, is rife with biblical imagery and touchstones. The first shot of Death Row looks like the lofty spires of a church. Before their execution, the men's hair is shaved into a tonsura, a style that was originally intended to mimic St. Paul and symbolise the giving of one's life to God. Then there is John Coffey himself, who shares the initials of Jesus Christ, performs miracles, absorbs the ills and evils that plague those around him, receives a St. Christopher medallion of a traveller destined for martyrdom, and is ordained with a halo of light before sacrificing himself for the sins of others. While these hints and explicit references to Catholicism and its anointed messiah are the mortar between the metaphors and themes on which this story rests, they do lead to an unpleasant but important residue that we really need to discuss. Make your blood curdle. The magical minority trope is when a supporting character who happens to be a person of colour possesses a worldly, wise and or miraculous disposition and uses these broadly commendable qualities almost exclusively to help a white protagonist. Are you alright? Well, I guess sometimes things have to come apart before we can put them back together again. Be it an existential crisis, self-reflective voyage, or any other bind the narrative throws their way, the magical minority is there to offer unwavering assistance and moral support from the sidelines to make sure their white counterpart can be all they can be. This is becoming embarrassing. Oh, no, sir. It's been embarrassing for quite some time now. Am I saying every film or piece of fiction that makes use of this tired cliché is bad or made with malicious, racist intent? Obviously, no. Here are just a few works featuring some form of ill-advised magical minority that are good if not great outside of that cruddy inclusion. So just leave the damn comments alone and hit the like button if you understand context. The problem lies in how this unfortunate archetype silos off these characters from the agency and narrative flexibility afforded to the Caucasian protagonist. It defines the white folks as normal, and the minorities as otherly, regardless of how broadly positive their portrayal may be. Their goodness and likability are still defined by how well they uphold and assist the star of the show. When you boil down the wants, needs, and aspirational aims of a minority character to help the white person become a better human being and solve their problems in spite of my own interiority or growth, that's troublingly close to servitude. If there is anything I can offer to help you in your time of need, just let me know. 
Stephen King is pretty much the well-meaning but not so self-aware titan of this trope. Now, The Shawshank Redemption and The Outsider are often erroneously cited in these discussions, even though both Red and Holly Gibney were written as white before being colorblind cast for their on-screen iterations. But with The Shining, The Stand, Mr. Mercedes, Dedication, The Talisman, and a few others, there are still more than enough examples to show that it's a trend rather than a quirk of King's output. <coughs> Given that John Coffey is literally magical, The Green Mile stands out as a particularly egregious case. He's an almost illiterate hulking miracle that sits in the shadows, cures his jailer and other ailing people of privilege, then dies immediately after his serfdom has run its course. His childlike affectations and earnestness also echoing the simple, uncorrupted, noble savage. Your name is John Coffey. Yes, sir, boss. Like a drink. Only not spelled the same. For as clumsily drafted as all that stuff undoubtedly is, it's worth considering the historical and allegorical intent behind the Green Mile, and why the fiercely anti-racist Stephen King and Frank Darabont opted to lean into such hack cliches when spinning this yarn. I'm tired, boss. In response to the more than fair scepticism around yet another magical minority in his work, King lamented that, while his original intention wasn't necessarily to make John Coffey a person of colour at all, after researching the social temperament and skewed judicial establishment of the book's time and setting, it was the only way to ensure this character would receive a death sentence given the piss poor legal representation and unsympathetic jury pools minorities had access to at this period period in time. Does it hurt yet? I hope it does. I hope it hurts like hell. Taking place in the 1930s, this is also a rare instance in which King opted to set the events in Louisiana rather than his native Maine, and with that comes a whole lot of anti-black baggage. Boy, you under arrest for murder. The Koufax Massacre, gerrymandering and racial zoning laws in direct violation of the Supreme Court, prolific and seldom checked clan activity from the 20s onwards, racially defined ownership restrictions on property, and the ongoing enforcement of Jim Crow segregationist policies. As such, racism and omnipresent prejudice became a much more prominent feature in what would have otherwise been a neat and tidy tale of a messianic figure condemned to die. The opening shots of a rifle-toting posse hunting through cotton fields call to mind the fervent prowl of a lynch mob. The chain gangs shuffling in the background of multiple scenes are largely black. Our first look at Coffee isn't of his face, but of his bare and shackled feet in a state of inescapable bondage. While his legal counsel compares the emotions and motivations of persons of colour to the pent-up violence of a farmyard dog. Well, in many ways, a good mongrel dog is like your negro. You get to know it. Often, you get to love it. It is of no particular use, but you keep it around because you think it loves you. None of this is told from John's point of view, but instead from Paul's, a naive, God-fearing man separated from slavery by a mere two generations, who is being given a crash course in the Western world's rancid foundations, and how he himself is one of the pillars upholding institutional racism. And while this certainly doesn't help the magical minority problem, it does go halfway towards understanding why a black story is being told with a pale, pasty tongue. It's because The Green Mile is ultimately a story about white guilt. On the day of my judgement, when I stand before God and he asks me why did I did I kill one of his true miracles? What am I going to say? No curtain under heaven is heavier than the curtain of guilt and lies behind which white Americans hide. 
That quote comes from an essay by the late great James Baldwin, which also serves as the origin for the term white guilt. It's the notion that the white populace carry with them the weight and shame of historical and contemporary racist actions that have benefited them either directly or indirectly, i.e. many of us are living on stolen land in cities built by slaves. It lays very heavily with the white community, it lays very heavily with the profiteers, it lays very heavily with the vested interests, it lays very heavily with a great middle stream in this country of people who have refused to commit themselves or even have the slightest knowledge that these things have been going on. These two words, when used in concert, seem to send conservatives into a browbeating frenzy and neoliberals into a toothless shame spiral. There's a reason it's a loaded term on all sides. Some refuse to acknowledge or accept the disgusting and ongoing legacy of racial inequality, so to them, white guilt is a call to arms to fight against ethnographic historical fact. There are those that use it as a further dehumanising distinction between black and white, and others use it as an excuse not to do anything, sheepishly saying, sorry I've actively benefited from all this horror, performatively doing next to nothing, and then failing to advocate or push for positive change in a real or meaningful manner. I am not a ward of America. I am not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. So how does this all tie into the Green Mile? Ostensibly, this is a film about well-meaning men whose job security, status, and financial liquidity in a time of economic downturn is dependent on a justice system and societal order carved out of racial inequality and culturally ingrained bigotry. Yet, despite their shame and disgust, none shear against the grain or step forward in defiance. As heavy as their culpability weighs on them, it doesn't translate into anything tangible. The switch is still thrown, the undeserving suffer, and the American experiment continues because guilt without a concerted and sacrificial effort to right those wrongs is useless. This is the first time I've ever felt real danger. Of hell. This is a ghost story where one man is haunted by the sins of a nation and cursed by his failure to act. Early on, Bitterbuck asks Paul, You think if a man sincerely repents on what he'd done wrong, that he might get to go back to the time that was happiest for him and live there forever? Would that be what heaven's like? I just about believe that very thing. More than 60 years on, Paul has found himself locked out of the heaven he once so truly believed in, cursed to wither in his impotent guilt, stripped of all he knows and loves, and not a million miles from the infantilizing institutionalization he once played a part in. Only rather than childish names for killing machines and playful japes with an adorable mouse, he's stuck in a limbo of designated nap times, supervised living, and purgatorial monotony. Forced to look on at the continuing injustices to which he was once culpable, in his youth he was too weak-willed to act, and in his advancing age is now too feeble to fight. But I will wish for death long before death finds me. I'm aware that this video has gone into some heavy subject matter, and yeah, there'll be some of you who think this film is sacrosanct, or those of you who think I went too easy on it. I'm not here to be centrist, but I'm also not going to throw out nuance for the sake of blinding praise or clickbait outrage. So yeah, I think it's fantastic, but with flaws that are worth acknowledging and parsing out. If you think it's an unbridled masterpiece warts and all, that's totally valid. If the Kingsian sentimentality and awkward racial archetypes aren't your thing, that's also great. It was my cup of tea. <laughs> And then, as with any pop cultural staple, there are going to be dorks who take any criticism against this film personally. This is the worst kind of discrimination, the kind against me. And killjoy contrarians who hate anything if they think it's remotely normy. I did not care for The Godfather. 
And yeah, both those kinds of people are completely insufferable pricks. As I hope this video is made very clear, there are moments of beauty and brilliance seared in my memory, complex implications and often undiscussed intricacies to the narrative. Other parts are muddled or regrettably regressive. But for me, all these years later, there's still enough soul, spark and avenues of discussion to make this mile well worth the walk. A Trained Circus Mouse for Jennifer C, Claire M D, Becky O, Hales and Rue, Historically Dumb, Jake R and Nicholas Le Revere, and a David Morse Makes Everything Better for all these amazing folks who support us over on Patreon. So how do you rate the Green Mile and what are your top 5 Stephen King adaptions? Let us know down in the comments, because the best way to support the channel is to engage, like, share and subscribe, and if you're in a position to do so, check out our Patreon at the link in the description below, where you can join the In Frame Out Film Club, add your name to the end credits, and get access to our private Discord. As always, thank you for watching, until next time, this is In Frame Out. <laughs>